So we're here at Carnegie Mellon University, and this is part of the chemistry department? Uh, this was a uh, laboratory called the um, National Facility uh, for High Field NMR. Okay. Medical Studies. And uh, in the basement of the Mellon Institute, where it's a nice firm of magnet one jingle so we can get the sharp spectrum. <laughs> we have dueling uh, video cameras here. Uh, this is the way, of course, we loaded the uh, program. And now it doesn't even run uh, into the loop. It just uh, stays uh, One of the things that I mentioned it was that we have a couple of uh, people who are associated with the museum, yes. uh, volunteers. One who actually worked at Scientific Data Systems mm -hmm. up and through the mid-70s, who was a hardware engineer. And then a, another couple of other people that were at a university back in Indiana that worked on these machines too. So if you could just do as much as you can, and then we can have George and Keith take a look at it when it gets to California. I'm sure they probably know more about it than I do because of course I have learned only what was necessary. Mm -hmm. First of all, I didn't do the installation of the machine. It was done by uh, Xerox, Xerox or... people with the help of one of our colleagues who is gone mm -hmm. since. And he has made actually a great contribution at the beginning you know, to help them and direct them how to wire things, etc. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, only when uh, he left, and actually many years after that, when we lost our operations manager, I didn't have much choice and I had to learn. You had to learn, and yeah. Since, of course, I know something about the electronics, so it was not too difficult for me, but as you know, these things are just... Uh, uh, just take a look at the number of programs we have uh, written. Oh, there, yeah. You know? and, uh, those are, of course, improvements. Uh, the program. Now the tapes are, those are spectra of our customers, you know, like right. people would come here, I'm sure Axel told you, use the instrument, they would stay here overnight eventually and run because it was running 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. And all the spectra were saved on the tape, so they eventually could come back and uh, get a copy if uh, something was lost or they thought maybe a little bit different resolution enhancement to be mm -hmm. done, you know, because we can do it. It was a rock well, I, was, I was telling Lee that I thought he also ought to take the uh, electronics uh, terminal there and well, uh, you, you know, the connections uh, so that they well, could... Although, uh, let, me, let me tell you actually something. Well, if, if, if they are really interested only 
as a Sigma 5, in spite that they would say, you know, what it was used for, then I would suggest that they put their own terminal on this. You know, they can can't find a terminal for the Sigma 5. Actually, I could give you also the name of a guy in Texas who was fixing those computers for okay. for the last users. That and, would be good. And, and actually, uh, I think that this disk is already uh, something we got from Westinghouse. At one point, Westinghouse did have two computers in Illinois. And so what I arrange is uh, we got one computer here and we gave the other computer to this guy in mm -hmm. Texas and he would uh, do the transportation for us. You know, mm -hmm. He brought it here and for years I was going into this, uh, uh, how do you call this, junk? <laughs> no, no, what is it? You know, a dark Star room, room. Uh, a store room. Ah, okay. And pulling parts and uh, components, I don't even call any more what, but I think that this guy was, because our this guy was only half half of the disk work, you know, one side. Oh, one side one of the side, platter. And the other, there was something wrong with the heads or whatever, mm -hmm. so we just replaced it. And, uh, yeah. and of course, you know, like memory cards, uh, we would replace. So it was uh, great to have, you know. The fun, what the problem was, we'd go there, pull it out, put it in, and it helped for a while. So probably, if you could like just go through and kind of tell us a little bit about the different parts of the machine, okay. and then um, like the key punch and the tapes and so forth, and I'll videotape that, and then maybe we could go across the hall where it's a little quieter, and y'all could tell me just to, uh, give me a little history about the machine, how you used it, uh, the national facility, and so forth. That'd be great. Okay. Well, so obviously uh, the. Uh, CPU is here, mm -hmm. and uh, as you can see, it's uh, technology of that time. It means cards in the rack and wired in the back, according to the schematics. And there are two of them. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, Cards plugged in here. You can certainly have the assignment of 32 cards in different uh, rows. And it's cabled together with the other parts of the machine through those cables over there. Okay. The, uh, the control panel is here. And of course it has the advantage that you can uh, Go in steps through the instructions, you know, by, by pushing the steps up. And it tells you what the instruction is to be executed in the next step. Mm -hmm. Not only that, you can go through the uh, individual clock cycles of one instruction. Okay? This ah, is, okay. These are the different phases of the same instruction and so if you know what it's supposed to do you can find out what's wrong mm -hmm. but it's a very tedious process uh, you can do it much faster if you are lucky by using the diagnostic tape it will print you the problem and then concentrate on the particular uh, okay. instruction okay all right now so here uh, we control the input when the computer is started, like OFO means the disk drive, and it will attempt to to load the program from the disk drive. Except now it just stops after a very few instructions, which we mm -hmm. have here, of course. And, uh, and uh, I can go and find out which, most probably, the disk drive uh, doesn't respond or something. <coughs> or we can change it to OEO and that would be the tape drive, and we can load this from the tape drive. Uh, that, of course, we do when we uh, load the uh, diagnostic tape. Mm -hmm. Or, of course, we can go to individual, like the uh, card reader. In the old days, mm -hmm. we used the card reader, which would be 0001. Sorry, this one, like the 002, mm -hmm. the terminal, and etc. So this is the, the control. What instruction is being performed and what is the 
content on the instruction. Of course, we have book where all the instructions are uh, uh, tabulated, so we know exactly like uh, branch or uh, load. You know mm -hmm. the uh, yeah. Now here are the control panels for the uh, external uh, pieces of the computer. Actually, we would say obviously the major thing first is the memory. Okay. So this is the memory, and the memory is a, a hard core memory. Okay. You can see it also from the other side. But I can open it. Uh, a little bit, but no, we cannot do so. We yeah. from the other side. So, how much uh, cord is this? Uh... Uh, Sixty-four kilobytes or uh, sixteen uh, kilowatts, because okay. it's thirty-two bit uh, work. Okay. So that's the memory, and. You know, we always, when we show this, we say that at the time when we tried to increase the size of the memory, it cost us $50,000. Somehow we never had $50,000. <laughs> so we, uh, we were simply more efficient with writing the program, you know. So mm -hmm. simply this uh, system. So here are then the uh, <coughs> external parts. Like this is the floating point here. Uh, Behind that are the uh, external units to control uh, okay. the uh, interfaces. interfaces to the units in the other room. So we can, uh, you know, the data acquisition and things like this. And uh, some of them are used also for the computer. I would have more time to. This is uh, for the printer, the control panel for the printer, and down there for the uh, teletype. Okay. Yep. So those are uh, the contents of this box here. Your uh, kicking a little bit. And, uh, <laughs> okay. Now this. I will uh, start it for you, it makes a lot of noise, which okay. is because the power supply is also bad. But, uh, I can of course uh, perform one uh, loading then, okay? But That'd be great. First I uh, show you this. Yeah. Okay. So this is hard risk. I uh, always say that the motor being used here can drive one of those small hybrid cars these days. <laughs> Very powerful <laughs> motor, we face. And uh, it's really amazing, you know, because we've uh, been running this for years. You know, the first one is, okay? I, I really don't know the, the, the years. Axel can calculate the years, but uh, we got the computer when, Axel? 70, 71, yeah. And I think that would be. Like in 91, I probably replaced the hard drive. Mm -hmm. 20 years, amazing. Yeah, it was running. Uh, the, from the very beginning, only half of the disk was, right? Yeah. Somehow, because we got this computer, so good. But these are, you, you can see how these uh, cards are, of course, inserted in the mm -hmm. rack. And, uh, this All discrete components, no ICs, I mean individual transistors. There are some ICs, mm -hmm. but you know, those uh, small, round, you know, like uh, mostly, I would say, operation amplifier with many uh, bands. That, yeah. of course, is uh, done by, uh, by ICs, but it was the very beginning of the ICs. Okay, now this thing, of course, needs the uh, air pressure. For the heads. Uh, okay. Transistors. Yeah. Yeah. That's the hard drive. And there is a regular compressor which provides the air for the floating heads for the start. Uh, okay? Mm -hmm. When it runs, I don't think it really needs it very much, but uh, still, you know, the whole thing. So this 
like an pressure gauge in there yeah. for the air pressure. And actually, I can sense, you know, let me stop this, okay, for you. I will stop the compressor. Yeah. I have to be careful because when I talk, I do usually stupid things, you know, <laughs> in the car and around the computer. But anyway, so you see this is. Okay, it stopped uh, now. It stopped now, and of course we can start it again. The only thing what we hear is of course the fans in, in right. the units. Okay. Now this is of course the schematic of the hard drive, so... This is almost your rad. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> it was always difficult to get the really uh, original schematics, you know, and, uh, we had to... Because they had so many versions, so we had to watch this. It was always a surprise when we found out, but this is different. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, and by but, the way, yeah. Yeah, by the way. Okay, now let me uh, start this for you. Okay. okay. So critical, but uh, mainly not to lose it. Right. And uh, okay. Close this. that the lights sometimes don't get the contact but uh, yeah now it blinks you know I mean it's it's all but it it's, this still works mm -hmm. I was using it for the uh, diagnostic diagnostic except uh, the uh, terminal uh, bombed out and uh, so this tape drive will so read. for example I can of course uh, try to start it I think it won't run. See? Yeah. It just just moved it, but it it run again into a problem. Okay. So that's the tape drive. So this tape drive is actually unique because I just noticed it'll read 200, 556, or 800 BPI. Well, okay. There, <laughs> there are not. I can't think Many. of any of yeah. those. Yeah, well, very old. Still around. Around. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, it could have uh, up to seven tape drives, as mm -hmm. you can see here. And, um, wow. and you know, this, this whole thing is nice. It's a vacuum column. Yeah. It's really an example of uh, beautiful technology, you know. The, uh, yeah. The vacuum columns, especially being able to move the tape so fast without yeah. without uh, hurting it. 
like really amazing. That's actually sometimes I had to load it directly like this mm -hmm. because the vacuum system and there are valves which of course go bad mm -hmm. and then the process of loading doesn't work. Right. So the first thing you load it manually and then have to fix it eventually. But even right. without those you can run the tape drive although you cannot load it, you know, but if you do it mm -hmm. manually it can be run. So there were uh, different uh, states of affairs <laughs> around here. Okay, now this of course was the original console teletype. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how it was delivered. And it was used for many, many years. But then we started to have difficulties with this, so and we couldn't get any replacement, so we decided to use uh, a little bit more modern. So what you see there is a, a black box which can convert F-stick, which is the right. uh, coding here and coding here, to ASCII, which we have, of course, you know, from the Harris computer, mm -hmm. the terminals. And this thing was working a month ago, although only after I fixed the power supply on the on the box, but uh, again it uh, just stopped working. So, so, so what we were using for the control now was this uh, CRT and this uh, terminal, mm -hmm. and we could uh, at least enter the basic commands, you know, with uh, connected with the diagnostic. Right. Okay. This thing didn't work for probably at least what uh, maybe by now maybe eight years or so. this this was the first thing which went card reader card reader yeah and of course you we were fixing it uh, but uh, then at one point we just uh, gave up and we simply limited you know the communication to the terminal The rest we could do uh, from the tape. Yeah. Right. We didn't have our programs on the tape. So we change it, but only very because you always had to type it. So we, mm -hmm. it was already at the end of it when we didn't change that much. Okay. And then, of course, this thing was printing, and probably, uh, as far as I know, this would be the easiest thing to fix. Uh, to work. it doesn't work at the moment comes with a fault but uh, again mm -hmm. you know finding few things this would be a that's a big problem but this is a, and this, this is practically but I'm sure also there are card readers available actually we do have one here is that the one we, we brought from Westinghouse or this is already the one we brought I think this looks like the original one but anyway so, so what I'm simply saying that this guy from Texas Unfortunately, I lost uh, touch with him. I called him at one point because he wanted to take this computer. Mm -hmm. He told me when he uh, got one from Westinghouse and he got the other one. So I promised him that once we stop the operation, he can have it. But then he lost interest and uh, I think we did use it for longer than he thought. <laughs> <laughs> and he may be switching you know, to other uh, right. computers. Then was um, printer and uh, okay. it's going to the back. We have, of course, some devices which uh, connect to the spectrometer itself, and uh, a very important step for us was when we introduced these digital synthesizers because in our experiment with this computer we would use rapid scan what we call rapid mm -hmm. scan technique and uh, so one of the very first program I, I wrote in uh, assembly language was how to scan the synthesizer over the spectral width we choose very efficiently because it had to change the frequency for each step mm -hmm. digitizing and you know the digitization of course depends on the frequency band you want to uh, uh, detect on the spectrometer we'll talk about it over there 
and that really allowed us to really do very meaningful experiments. Uh, once we, one of them were for, for the sweep, the other one was for what we call uh, double irradiation experiments. Okay, and to, to get this going, we needed uh, you know some uh, devices to uh, take the clock from the computer and uh, interface and interface. With Coffee, Did you make coffee, Axel? Pardon? Did you make coffee? No, I just waited. <laughs> okay. However, I will make some, so uh, I have some. Well, I think, why don't we make some? You get, get. Oh, the water is already here, so... Yeah. Into the next series of disasters. <laughs> With fresh enthusiasm into the next series of disasters. Ah, it's, is that a couple who've just gotten married? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Axel, have you been here? Yes. Before, so but we can go ahead for the for the video. Yeah. All right. Uh, so this was the uh, original electronics for a 250 megahertz spectrometer, mm -hmm. which was standing on this spot here, and it was much smaller than our 600. But this was in 1969, right? Yeah. We brought it in. 68. Actually, I was here since 67 and I helped to build that magnet uh, with Westinghouse and then we operated here we learned how to do the cryogenics uh, because it had to be filled with helium mm -hmm. uh, three times a week, a week I guess yes. right yeah mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, that it was uh, at that time again for a short time the highest field in the world Mm -hmm. Of course, proudly with all this uh, mention, but only for a couple of months or so. Yeah. <laughs> However, it was also a uh, you know, multi-nuclear. That's right. That was unique. Yeah, it was like much more versatile than a commercial uh, 220 megahertz and then 300 megahertz variant. But of course, they were uh, catching up very fast. Uh, with us, but still we did have an enormous number of uh, customers coming here. I'm sure one reason was that they could use it uh, whenever they had any, you know, access to NIH grants or mm -hmm. actually had a discretion to uh, to give some time to people once they yeah. found out, you know, that uh, it was uh, useful. So could you just describe what uh, it meant to be a national facility? Um, uh, what it meant? Well, what it meant was that you were supposed to uh, provide this technical capability to take high field uh, spectra to any investigators, you know, in the United States or even outside the United States uh, doing uh, research in biomedical area and uh, helping them determine the uh, composition and formula and structures of the, of the molecules they were studying. Mm -hmm. uh, we had uh, generally, I would say, uh, between one and two hundred investigators a year visiting us over the entire period of time uh, and obtaining results at this, uh, at this place. So was it mostly uh, people with NIH grants, or uh, what, what types well, of work often, were people doing? Often. Sometimes they were supported by the NIH, sometimes they were supported by the NSF, sometimes they were, they were in a uh, pharmaceutical company. And they were or university, the, you know, mm -hmm. chemistry department yeah. of any university right. could uh, get time on this. Uh, <clears throat> so, and as I say, we had the advantage that uh, we could uh, look at uh, not just Protons. hydrogen, hydrogen NMR spectra, but we could look at uh, phosphorus and uh, deuterium and I forget all what, but you know, many, many different. Boron was, for example, boron one of was the very, early, very uh, popular. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, so it was uh, very successful, and in fact, in the mid '70s. Uh, roughly half of the publications uh, reporting NMR studies of uh, uh, structures of you know, biological materials and so on 
uh, were originated in this in this laboratory. Ah. Yeah. So, Pretty significant. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did good work. So, do, you, do you drink coffee? No, I don't. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, why don't you tell me a little bit about your background? Uh, my background. Well, I don't know how far back do you want me to go. <laughs> well, we had talked. You had started. You had gotten your doctorate uh, at Harvard, or you had worked uh, yeah, at Harvard after. Yeah, no, I uh, I was uh, uh, I got my undergraduate uh, work at the University of Minnesota, and uh, then I went into the war, uh, army, uh, for a couple of years, and uh, went to France and got shot in the knee and came back. And uh, then I uh, applied for graduate studies, at first at uh, New York University and then at Harvard. And I got my degree there. Uh, went from uh, there to the Brookhaven National Laboratory and worked for a few years there. And then went to Switzerland and spent a year studying with the organic chemist in Zurich, bought a near Prelog, then came back to uh, Harvard and uh, had an offer as a, to be an instructor in the lowest, uh, in sort of the yard bird of the faculty mm -hmm. <laughs> in the chemistry department there, and I spent uh, four, four or five years there. Then came here and went to uh, this building, uh, housed an organization called the uh, Mellon Institute. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was an independent research organization founded by the Mellon family. And about uh, ten years later, uh, there was a merger between Mellon Institute and Carnegie Institute of Technology, which formed Carnegie Mellon University. So I uh, was uh, became the head of the chemistry department when this merger happened, and uh, have been in the chemistry department ever since. I worked as dean of the science college for about five years, and uh, now I'm retired, <laughs> so I'm a university professor emeritus. Mm -hmm. And Joseph, how did you end up here? Uh, well, it was quite an uh, exciting story because uh, I, of course, was born in Czechoslovakia, and uh, uh, I studied electrical engineering uh, in Brno, in the Technical mm -hmm. University. and. Uh, uh, and there in an institute for scientific instruments of the Czechoslovak Academy of Sciences, where I got my PhD there. And, uh, uh, started very early, actually in 1956 maybe, or so, uh, seven, in NMR, uh, thanks to one of my colleagues there. And. Uh, uh, we started to build uh, NMR spectrometers for the chemists. Mm -hmm. And so we started like everybody here, except uh, with some delay. And what year was that? Uh, well, I would say uh, 58, 59. Mm -hmm. uh, I just uh, would have to think more uh, to find out exactly the years. But yeah, I think at that time. But you know, we started with 30 megahertz. That's uh, where the first NMR experiments were made, actually, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Almost certainly at Varian, that, that 30 mm -hmm. megahertz. By the way, uh, when we say 30 megahertz, what we say at the same time that you know we did have the available magnetic field, which would provide uh, proton spectroscopy at this frequency, and it's directly proportional to the field. So by going to higher field, we would go to higher frequency. And the advantage of this was uh, a better sensitivity and better resolution. Mm -hmm. So it's like increasing the resolution of the microscope, you know, going and you could see more and more details. And so of course we went through the 30, 40, 60, and the last spectrometer which I built there with a the group. I was uh, head of the uh, NMR group there. <coughs> it was 80 megahertz. In the meantime, of course, in the United States. Uh, they have built a superconducting magnet for NMR. It was done by one of our colleagues, uh, a 
uh, we worked for Varian at that time. This is out in California. In California, yeah. Palo Alto, yeah. What's his name? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I knew you were going to ask me that. Okay. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so, so it was exciting for everybody in the world, you know, because it was a big jump. We, we were limited to about 100 megahertz with the electric electromagnets, and everybody practically ended that with electromagnets. But the first superconducting magnet of Bavarian was 220 megahertz, a big jump. Wow, yeah. And so, you know, the spectra were just uh, gorgeous. And so I said, well, we have to learn how to build those magnets. I have to go to the United States. Mm -hmm. But of course, it was communistic Czechoslovakia at that time. It was not that simple. Because to get here, first you had to arrange a connection here to get the invitation, which was not difficult. But then to get out was difficult. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. A couple of times I ended in Prague at the airport, uh, and they told me, well, sorry, you don't have exit visa. And I had to go back. But then I uh, talked to uh, the top guy in the academy, uh, who fortunately was chemist. Mm -hmm. Actually, he did have an American Chemistry uh, Society award, uh, mm -hmm. because he was a famous uh, in terpenes, I guess. I don't know exactly where it was. But, well, anyway, I told him, uh, if uh, we are supposed to make some progress in this field. Uh, I have to go to the United States, the conference, ENC. He, yeah. By the way, he was running here in uh, Pittsburgh at this uh, at this institute here. Okay? Mellon Institute. Mellon Institute at that time, yeah, and uh, with some other colleagues, yeah. And uh, so he gave me a magic letter, which opened and all the doors, and finally I came here. Actually, the first time I mm -hmm. sent the uh, uh, abstracts, <laughs> And then I couldn't come, but uh, but uh, uh. the second abstract was successful, and I was here. You had the magic letter. That's <laughs> right. And uh, so it was great, of course. You know, for me it was. You know, we were uh, sort of isolated from the West for so many years, so so many things were new for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, fortunately, you know, we were uh, with Westinghouse. Uh, uh, the experiment worked out. They knew how to make magnets. I knew something about homogeneity of the magnets and uh, so uh, uh, actually it really ended as a, as a real spectrometer but in the meantime in at the end of 1968 actually in August in 1968 when I already sort of was preparing to go home and while having my family here for uh, on a tourist uh, sort of stay the Russians occupied Czechoslovakia mm -hmm. and that has changed my career because I said as long as they will be there I'm not going back and they were there unfortunately 20 years yep. so it was a bit too late to go back so that's how I ended here and Axel uh, graciously offered me here a, a position in the group so I could stay and uh, work out my problems of course you know with uh, extending the visa first and then uh, asking you know for immigration papers and things like that and uh, uh, of course, during all the time, then I worked with him on the instrumentation, and, mm -hmm. and he just told you about the 250. It was a big success because it was so universal. Since you know we did have here some technicians working with me, so we could always build a box or a attachment or arrangement. Uh, it certainly never was a, a commercial sort of grade of uh, of instrumentation, you know, because uh, once it worked, we would just leave it in a box and. Uh, use it simply mm -hmm. and, and you can still see that these things uh, look very primitive but uh, but they were working here for 30 years <laughs> because when we uh, got the, here come here uh, I'll show you something here <coughs> IGC which was a spin-off of General Electric actually the first letter is still carries the General Electric company uh, uh, head and Axel got a letter that they know how to make uh, better materials for superconducting magnets for higher fields. And you can see what he did. Oh, he, he wrote my name and 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 uh, uh, Stracker. That's the other guy who actually started with the computer, who taught me uh, ah, about okay. computers. You know, mm -hmm. because I knew about analog computers, but not so much about digital computers at that time. And uh, so I. Uh, went there I guess and discussed I told them what we need they were horrified when they heard what you know this 
NMR needs very homogeneous field uh, in the order of 10 to minus 8, 10 to minus 9 within the sample. Wow. Changes, it's very, very, really, very homogeneous, and I'll tell you how one gets this. But, uh, and the other thing, it has to be very stable, but only stable in the reference to the frequency you excite, so that can be electronically relatively easy mm -hmm. obtained, although not easy, it's, uh, it's possible, we have done this. And uh, <clears throat> for the homogeneity, there are tricks. You know, you just uh, put some correcting coils, and then the final thing is you spin the sample. It's not our invention, but actually has been invented very early. Uh, and everybody spins the sample. Did you did you show yeah. me the sample? No, I not not yet. Okay, so we'll go there, so you know how. But anyway, so this was the beginning of the 600 era, mm -hmm. and we asked you know for the money and they. We suggested 500 megahertz, and they said, well, it's not high enough. So we talked a little bit and said, okay, so let's make 600. <laughs> <laughs> and they did have some ideas how to stabilize it, but uh, it didn't work. But our classic idea, which I used on the electromagnet, worked pretty well. And uh, so in 1970, uh, when, when I, did I show the first phosphorus spectrum? Many trips between uh, IGC and, uh, and here, probably 77, 70, 77 or 78, we were able. California. Yeah, it was, I brought it to a conference, yeah. and of course it was astonishment for, because at that time the commercial was only 360 megahertz, and the 600 was far and far away, actually it took oh, yeah. 10 years. Wow. No, eight years. Yeah. Eight years. It took them eight years to, to get the first commercial 600. Mm -hmm. And so for that time, anybody who wanted to do high field had to come to Pittsburgh. And, uh, and this was, a, and the Sigma was put in place in 71? The, the Sigma was uh, part of the uh, 250. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, it was then continuing with the 600 at the beginning. Actually, uh, when we were making these uh, tests, the initial tests, at IGC, we would just pull out a few of these panels here, mm -hmm. and uh, we would uh, add a few more converters, you know, from uh, 250 megahertz to 600 megahertz, and we would bring it to IGC, set it up on the floor, and sometimes with uh, a rain coming through the roof. <laughs> <laughs> We were doing the experiments there, and of course with the strong support from Axel, who would always bring at least one bottle of teacher's whiskey. <laughs> and thanks to the teachers, we were able to get it going there. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and of course we have many pictures from the time. Uh, by the way, we did get an uh, award for the 600, which you can see then in my office uh, later, the IR100 award. I don't know whether you're familiar with that, but... Uh, it's a, each year they choose 100 uh, outstanding achievements in the uh, industry and in science. Uh, it's on, more on the technical side mm -hmm. and, and they give them the award. So this we go with the Intermagnetic General Corporation, which of course built the magnet. And by the way, the magnet, the picture is over here. So it's a, it's a small piece. It's a niobium tin tape magnet, uh, which is then, of course, immersed in liquid helium and uh, uh, cooled down, obviously. Now, the uh, uh, sort of uh, uniqueness of this magnet is there is no other like this because this one was continuously energized by 160 amps. Mm -hmm. they, were not able to get it uh, persistent, what we call it. You know, there was always a, a small resistance in the uh, joints there. And uh, so, as we will go here, I'm sorry, right to the other room. <coughs> and this is the 600 megahertz, uh, the way it worked here since 1979. Yeah, since 1979. Until about four years ago, I think four or five years ago, we, we stopped. Mm -hmm. And it's that magnet you have seen on the picture there, inside. It's a liquid helium door, 
liquid nitrogen door, and it has a bore in the middle. And the probe, which uh, holds the RF circuitry, goes into the magnet. It's on that stand you can see there. Mm -hmm. And the sample is uh, first put into a small spinner, air spinner. That's what does the rotation then in the magnetic field. And it's dropped into the center of the magnet in the center of the coil. Mm -hmm. And that's how the interaction between RF energy and the nuclei of the particular atom you are looking at how it works. And that's what we call 5 millimeter sample tube, which is the most popular. There are, of course, other dimensions for different uh, uses. So could you talk just a little bit about how the, the sigma worked in this entire system? We have uh, the doer with the magnet. We have the control panel in the other room. Then we yeah, have the sigma. Back, you know. here, here, I have to show you this thing. This, uh. this is the most important contribution <laughs> I ever made. This is for inserting the tube down, you know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, this is uh, how the probe might look like. You know, it's one of the probes here. This one is for solid uh. state. Okay. You put it down until it's in the probe, and then you eject it. Yeah. Right? Ah! <laughs> it's probably that's because that's his invention. <laughs> and it worked for all these years. Well, if it works. Yeah. <laughs> if it ain't broke, don't fix it. The, the commercial system. Okay. So the control of the Sigma 5 is, uh, or was done from here. And, and that's an old Tektronix graphics terminal. Yeah. And about uh, a month ago, or whenever you, when you send us the letter, you know, I, I started all things. So for eight hours, everything was working, including this. Mm -hmm. And I was seeing here, because each scan it would tell you, you know, it was count the scans here. So anyway, from here you would uh, load the program. And for example, here are the simple commands, uh, what you want to do, okay? Two letter commands for correlation spectroscopy and so you can see like uh, uh, let's see uh, raw data for example here so it will call the raw, last raw data from the disk mm -hmm. or uh, display a plot display yeah that uh, signal. will be like with AN for example okay N analyze data to the scope so we will print, over here. print the spectrum on this uh, persistent uh, screen here. And uh, obviously you can see how many they are, quite a number. Like for example, uh, the common things would be to put the number of scans you would like to run. Because uh, the, the idea about this NMR experiment is to <clears throat> be able to detect uh, 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 weak signals coming from uh, diluted samples. Okay, you you cannot always uh, afford concentrated sample for a variety mm -hmm. of reasons. And then what you do, you just uh, repeat the experiment uh, n times, n being ten, hundred, thousand, and the signal-to-noise ratio improves by the square root of this. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a general relation. So, for example, if you take make ten scans. Then the signal—I mean, 100 scans. Then the signal noise ratio is 10 times better. Okay. Right. So each experiment would be very seldomly with only one scan, at least 10 scans, because of course it was uh, after introduction of these techniques. See, the original when I came, uh, it was just uh, starting, but uh, we would run the recorder, and the recorder would sweep the frequency, you know, mm -hmm. in an analog way you know, running one of those synthesizers here, and it would print out uh, spectra, and I'm sure we have such spectra somewhere. But oh, I saw there. some earlier. We looked here at some that's yeah, up on the wall. Yeah, And of course, uh, so that would take very long, like uh, the spectrum, the higher the resolution, the slower the scan. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it would take 500 seconds or 1,000 seconds. And of course, you know it's a long time, and the signal noise ratio would be only the basic for one scan. Okay, mm. but then uh, the guy who got the Nobel Prize, 
and his friends from Varian came with the idea to use uh, Fourier transform spectroscopy. And what they did, they just excited the nuclei with a pulse, accumulated the signal within one to five seconds. So of course then they can repeat, you know, the hundred scans in five hundred seconds, but hundred mm -hmm. scans ten times better signal noise ratio. And then you have to process the data because the data come in a different form. Mm -hmm. And the processing was the Fourier transform. Okay? And this is the technique you being used today uh, for uh, most of the uh, spectrometer. What is this? This is uh, yeah, correlation, right? Spectra. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but it, okay. Now, of course, uh, what we did here. Uh, something more interesting, but you actually, yeah. What what we did here is uh, uh, we thought for a variety of reason that one can do similar experiments in a different way. Uh, this is sort of from my uh, uh, electrical engineering background. Uh, there are certain formulas, you know, for uh, obtaining what we call transfer function of a system, mm -hmm. okay? linear system mainly. And so uh, I came uh, with the idea to use instead of pulse excitation, an excitation with a linear sweep a fast linear sweep, fast scan. You just scan through the spectrum uh, within one second like, uh, and accumulate data at the same time using time sharing. And this was, of course, obtained by this pulse generator. So the experiment would run like this. You just type the number of scans, the sweep width, uh, from where to where to scan. And then the computer would do the job by sending the uh, frequency information into the tectronics. They were done uh, led by cables into this synthesizer here. And at the end, to the magnet, we would get the appropriate frequency, which uh, was in the latest uh, time, 620 megahertz for protons, OK? And it would create pulses. Uh, like typical, you know, it would make eventually, uh, I don't know, uh, 2,000 pulses per second. And uh, at the same time, the frequency would move. And uh, after each pulse, the data would be accumulated. And we would get what we call raw data. And then the raw data, again, needed uh, uh, computer processing. And this time, the necessary processing was cross-correlation with the reference line. And that's why we call the technique uh, correlation technique. And then, because of uh, some uh, complications with uh, uh, the name being used for other things, uh, it ended with rapid scan Mm -hmm. correlation technique. Rapid scan was added to it and uh, so that because there are some other correlation techniques. So anyway, uh, so that would be, of course, the data would be stored on the disk and uh, and then you could uh, type uh, the commands here by first bringing the data and then filtering it, smoothing, processing. You could resolution enhance that actually you could get better resolution than the nature gives us by using some of the uh, tricks of uh, digital signal processing, okay? And the sigma and, and would the do sigma, that. And the sigma, of course, was doing it from day one, and it was doing it at the 250 megahertz, and then again at the 600 megahertz. Now, of course, we couldn't ignore, you know, the advantages of the pulsed experiments, which are much more versatile and they have taken over the field, so we did have to uh, go to other computers because this computer certainly had limitation, memory, and things mm -hmm. like this. But also, whenever things were available commercially, we would buy it uh, as, as, as Axel would get some money from NIH, right? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so one of the uh, things which we added to the 600 megahertz spectrometer is this console here from Varian. This was a 400 megahertz console. We bought it, usually with some discount. And because we always fought uh, uh, with the uh, funding. And uh, here, there is a computer which is pulled up, actually. Which one is it, Axel? <laughs> Remember? Yeah. Okay, I, I know, of course, except uh, 
Vax, right? That was the name of the computer, Vax. Ah, okay. Vax. Yeah, digital Vax. Or deck Vax. No, no, that can't be right. No, it's not no, Vax, no. It's too, too small for them. Okay, well, we have books here. It's amazing, you know, because we we still worked on the great, the whole thing into the electronics uh, we didn't have built for our computer. Mm -hmm. And then, <clears throat> depending on the type of experiment, because for, for some experiments, still our technique was uh, better, superior simply, getting better results. And so we would switch between what we call correlation and FT. On the other hand, you know, like people coming from outside, they were more familiar with the FT technique because there were only very few spectrometers in the world operating on this. Although a Japanese company started to commercially mm. sell a spectrometer with uh, rapid scan correlation. And, uh, <clears throat> but still the, uh, the pulsed excitation uh, was then expanded by introducing so-called two-dimensional NMR spectroscopy, which to do with uh, this rapid scan is theoretically possible, but it didn't bring any advantages, so we never really tried to do that. And, uh, and so for two-dimensional spectra, we always were using this variant console. And for a while, actually, we did have another console. It was a Brooker console, which is in the room, uh, the same room with the magnet. That was actually our first FT console. That, that was our uh, second and last FT or mm -hmm. Fourier transform console. So, how did you come by the sigma? Okay, Axel, I think you should tell about the sigma. Yeah. Or actually, I, I look for the computer and you should tell about the sigma. I, I, I don't think it's, it's, it's probably not here. Just, yeah. just, I think just it's there on the. Uh, uh, came about that we got this. This is yours. That's mine, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, the uh, we were not the first owners of this uh, uh, computer. The uh, uh, National Institutes of Health, uh, in response to a proposal from a mass spectroscopist who was at, uh, I believe, Purdue University uh, in Indiana, uh, had applied to buy a sigma computer to control his mass spectrometry experiments. And uh, they indeed awarded it to him. Uh, and he used it uh, for a couple of years at uh, Indiana. But uh, he then moved to uh, Syracuse, Cornell, Cornell, I think he went to, and uh, left the uh, sigma five behind. And uh, the people at University of Purdue didn't see any particular use for it for them, and they informed the NIH, and the NIH didn't want to just junk it, so they uh, conceived the idea of telling all of their grantees that if they needed a computer for uh, uh, their work, uh, there was a Sigma 5, that, uh, and they would, should write a proposal and explain what they were going to use it for, and if the NIH agreed that that was a good thing to do, they would then give that person the computer. So we uh, wrote a proposal and fortunately <laughs> the NIH decided that they sent them the best one that they uh, had so uh, they transported it from uh, Indiana to uh, Pittsburgh and installed it here at the, the uh, XDS uh, people come and set it up and get it running. And that was 71? Um, that was 1971. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we had had it about three weeks, I came in one morning, and the uh, computer room, where it's located now, was full of steam. Mm -hmm. The uh, ceiling like this had uh, come down, and there was wet mush lying all over the top of the computer and her and everything. And I thought we had, you know, $300,000 worth of junk mm -hmm. at that point. A steam pipe had broken? Yeah. No, what happened was a, it's a very strange thing. There was a temperature control and humidity control system that had been installed for this, for the computer room a long time before. We had a, in, uh, in the uh, 60s, early 60s, we had a control data system computer 1604 
uh, in there, which was being used for quantum mechanical calculations and things. Uh, and this worked by a, uh, having a chilling coil and then a steam reheat uh, system in the, uh, as the air was circulated, it was cooled down to remove the water and then reheat it up to the set temperature by a, by a steam coil. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, steam coil had frozen and cracked, and so <laughs> it just injected steam in there. <laughs> uh, we had, there's a recording. We had a record, recorder monitoring the humidity and temperature at all times in there. And, uh, uh, it was, you know, it was, uh, it was up against the top. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so we called Xerox Data Systems and told them what had happened. And they sent some people out and they said, well, it may not be too bad because the Sigma 5 was built under something called uh, Jan Specs, uh, Joint Army Navy. And so the part of the specifications uh, for this machine were that it would work in the jungles in Borneo. <laughs> you know, and it should be insensitive to being raised to high humidity and high temperature. Mm -hmm. uh, the main problems that had happened to the computer were that the, the uh, lubricants for all the fans, the cooling fans and so on, had been stained out <laughs> uh. the bearings, and they had replaced all the, uh, the fans. And then they you know, dried it up and so on and turned it on. So the Sigma, it, instead of... It's an extremely robust machine. Yeah. Um, so the, you didn't come by the go through an evaluation process. It's just that the machine was available and you yeah. needed a machine. And, yeah. yeah. At, this, at that time, the computer was being to the NMR experiment. So, uh, mm -hmm. they, they just started maybe two years or And it, it was that uh, to do me work in, in the combining room, you need a computer. We just uh, got this, uh, we always joke, you know, we have the highest magnetic, we have the biggest <laughs> and it's spread on the area, you know, because it has a separate, I mean, all these, right. things, of course, you have everything inside and, uh, and everything else in the mag. Well, the Sigma series, before they put